Hey, tonight, I would pray that you'd welcome our friends, Pastor Frank and Leah Sanchez. They're going to... And they're going to lead us in worship, and Frank's going to lead us in uh, the study of Psalm 23 tonight. So how exciting, amen? So I turn it over to my brother. Let's praise the Lord, shall we? Oh, well, welcome. Thank you guys for having us tonight. I'd love to invite you to stand. I don't know how you normally do it, but I'm just, if you want to stand, and if you want to sit at any time, feel free to do so. But let's go before the Lord and thank Him for the opportunity. Lord, we're looking forward to being with you. We are grateful, God, for your presence whenever two or more are gathered. And Lord, we know that you inhabit our praises. So Lord, as we bring our praise unto you, we would just ask that you would be glorified, lifted high in our hearts, Lord, and we would be drawn close to you as a result of being here tonight. We love you, Lord. We pray we would love you more as a result of being here on this night. In Jesus' name, everybody agreeing, saying... Amen. Praises rising, eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Hope is stirring, hearts are yearning for you. We long for you, cause when we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away, they're washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us. Worthy of all our praises Hosanna, Hosanna Come have your way among us We welcome you here, Lord Jesus Hear the sound of hearts returning to you we turn to you in your kingdom broken lives are made new you make us new Cause when we see you we find strength to face the day in your presence all our fears are washed away, they're washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way. Welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God who saves us. You're worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna. Come have your way. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Ah, it's good to worship, isn't it? Yeah, praise the Lord. Hey, a couple friendly reminders, if you don't mind. Hey, we, you remember a couple of weeks ago we had a little bit of a challenge with uh, some of our tithe checks. I mean, they, they're all, uh, we received the tithes on uh, the, uh, 
the month of 531 and between 531 and 64. Remember that uh, we had to, to uh, attach some names to some of those tithes. We got half of the folks, we got half of you. We, we have about nine more people that have checks that need to be accounted for. I mean, we, we need to account for them. You're, you're good, but the church, uh, we, we had a problem with the bank. And so anyway, if you have, if you put in a tithe check, if cash members, you're fine. But you remember, if you put in a tithe check between 531 and the week of 531 and 64, we need to have uh, your name uh, so we can give you credit for your check, okay? So we got about nine more people out of 18, so we've got half of you. We need the other half. And so if we could get that knocked out, that would be a big help uh, to the bookkeeper. And again, we want to get you credit for your tithe. And so please, uh, right away, if we can get that taken care of. Uh, that'd be a big help for the administration office. As you know, the stout-hearted men and the women of the word are off for this summer. So we're enjoying just breaking the routine and goofing off a little bit during the summer. So enjoy, but we will be heading back come September and the exact date will be announced as we get a little closer. Prayer at the Harupa Valley Sheriff's Station tomorrow at 9 a.m. Please come join us. Uh, we have a great time. The, uh, the first responders love us. And so we're right out here off of Mission Boulevard. You can't miss it, the, the Harupa Valley Sheriff Station. Come join, come join us. We've got a good little group and we'd like to double it up if we could, if that would be the Lord's will, but we'd love just to have you. So nine to 9.30 and then we'll cut you loose, get you back to the house and whatever, back to your daily routine, whatnot. Agape Way, July the 28th. July the 28th, which is a Friday, as you know. August the 26th, right out here at Agate Park, Grief Share Barbecue, Worship, and Fellowship. So August the 26th, mark it down, 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. And so we're gonna be drawing attention to the Lord out at Agate Park and enjoying some time with the Grief Share and just really just letting the Lord continue to minister to our Grief, uh, grief Share folks. It's been a great ministry and so we wanna continue to allow the Lord to bless. And the final thing is, as you know, the Bless and Be Blessed uh, Food Ministry are, are collecting their fundraiser. Uh, they're collecting soft goods that are in good condition. Um, you know, I've got plenty of rags that I keep in the garage and I use the rags accordingly. So we don't, we want good, good clothing that, that is still serviceable and things like that. And so if, if you'd like to participate in that regard, uh, that would be great. But these are some of the things that we're continuing to look at throughout the week and throughout the month. Amen. So Father, continue to bless as we continue to worship, and we thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, what a joy to hear you all worship. I tell you what, you're going to spoil us. Man, usually, usually our congregation is just throwing stuff at us. <laughs> That's really... Anyway, it is a blessing to be with you. I, uh, Pastor Calvary Christian Fellowship in Colton. My wife, Leela, has been by my side for 26 years now. We've been married that long. We have, we have four kids, and this week we're kind of empty nesters. So uh, we had the chance to, to be out and about and whatnot, and I, we heard that Sam was um, moving somewhere or whatever else. We've moved several times. We, we moved overseas uh, to Spain for some time and came back through Orange County and then back into my hometown, which is like, God, seriously, I lived in Colton. We could have just gone 10 miles over. It is, you know, <laughs> it really was very simple, but it wasn't uh, the, the way God wanted it. Bless the Lord. Well, as you know, we are in Psalm 23. I'd love to ask you, if you would, to go there in your Bible. And then if you would mind, if you wouldn't mind, rather, if you would stand with me when you get there. What I want to do is I want to read it to you as you read along. It used to be that when we ha all had King James Version Bibles, this is a very simple thing, but now we sound like we need an interpreter. Like there's a lot of tongues going on. Someone has the NIV, the CSB, the BLT over here. So anyway, so we're going to, I'm going to read it. You're going to read along. Stand with me. Psalm 23. We're going to read the whole psalm. Verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. Oh, what did I just tell you guys? <laughs> The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. 
He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, thank you so much for your word, and we pray now that as we reflect upon it, as we ask your Holy Spirit to teach and lead and guide us, we would ask, Lord, that we would have a greater understanding of why you have preserved this wonderful psalm for us. We pray now that you would anoint this time and be in it in Jesus' name. Everybody agreeing, saying, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Psalm 23 is arguably the most beloved, best-known psalm in all the earth. In every Hollywood movie, the funeral, when it is portrayed, Psalm 23 is the somber, quiet reflection of the minister in the background. In fact, if I do your funeral, you will hear me do Psalm 23. Of course, if it's your funeral and you hear me doing Psalm 23, somebody has failed massively along the way. But this psalm centers around a topic that Israel would have been intimately aware of as the entire nation was virtually founded by shepherds. When Jacob made his way down to Egypt, even after Joseph warned them not to divulge their occupations, all confessed before Pharaoh that they had been shepherds from their youth, both we and our fathers. Genesis chapter 46, verse 34. God looked upon the leaders eventually of Israel as shepherds. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 7. And of course, at the time of this writing, the most famous shepherd in all of Israel was the shepherd king, psalm writer David. And this beautiful section, David writes an homage to his shepherd. Many commentators would confess to you and believe that this was written sometime later in his life. And we're going to find out what he thought of his shepherd. What makes God a great shepherd of his sheep? What does he offer that no other shepherd can? Let's examine this together and see what we discover. Verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. What a beautiful statement to read. The Lord is my shepherd. David uses the covenant name of God to reveal the strength of their relationship. This faithful God of Israel is my shepherd. Please make note of the tense of that phrase. This psalm only makes sense to those who have a present tense relationship with their God. If he was someone's shepherd or could be their shepherd in the future, this psalm will fail to land its punch. Scholars, again, believe that this was written later in his life. David was trying to figure out how he could assess his life's success. What was the explanation? How did he survive a royal hunt in the wilderness from Saul, who was committed to chasing him down? How had he led Israel to such a prosperous position regionally? How could one possibly explain his rags-to-riches story when even his father forgot to invite him to the lunch with Samuel? The Lord is my shepherd. David, for all of his wisdom and his prowess, knew that he was not the master of his own destiny. He was simply a lamb, and God was his shepherd. I pray you see yourself that way. You see yourself as a lamb that belongs to the shepherd of your soul. There's no power, by the way, in acknowledging that he's a shepherd. That's, That's no good. And you can't even tell if he's good unless you know him personally. Because God is David's shepherd, one of the primary benefits is that he shall not want. 
This phrase might be better translated, I have no lack. And what a great truth to be told. You know, every shepherd's job is predicated upon anticipating need. For a lamb, like David, or like any one of us, to admit that they are without need is a wonderful testimony. David's words are powerful, especially in the light of modern thinking, don't you think? Many choose today to run their own lives, believing the false narrative that they know what's best for their lives and have the power to affect it. And no matter how it appears, even for a moment, they're dead wrong. Only those who walk in the shadow of their shepherd can say truthfully that they know what a life without lack is. So David describes this life first in light of provision. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. It may surprise you to learn that sheep are not prone to lie down. I didn't know this before I studied this passage. Mostly because I'm prone to lie down. I love lying down. But I don't have the spiritual gift of it that my son Caleb does. When he was younger, he would get up out of bed long enough to land on the couch and then he'd slink down to the floor and eventually land on our lazy boy chair. And it was like perfectly named for him at that time. Lazy boy. That, that was like the thing. He had a spiritual gift of laying down. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, but sheep don't do that. Look at this. God causes... He makes, he causes his sheep to lie down, to relax in green, lush, and fresh pastures where the ground is both soft and nourishing. Philip Keller wrote a book many years ago entitled A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. Are you familiar with that? Who's read that book before? And nobody has ever read the book. Okay, everywhere I go, same thing. You guys got to read this book. It's a, it's a standard work. I heartily recommend it to you. According to him, a lamb won't lay down under four conditions. First of all, in the face or fear from predators. Second, he won't lie down if there's friction between he and another sheep. Third, he won't lie down if flies are around to pester him. And fourth, he won't lie down if there's famine. So imagine what David is insinuating here about the shepherding wisdom of his covenant God. First of all, God knows how to eliminate our fears. To take care of that which most causes us whatever phobia it might be. He knows how to deal with that. To calm our hearts in the face of fear. He knows how to grant wisdom and peace among our fellows. To be able to take care of that which might be irritating between fellow believers. I know it doesn't happen here. But uh, at our church, we have several people who love to make it their, their life's mission to destroy my life. You know? uh, and, and that's just my own family who comes. But anyway, uh, and, and then there's flies that pester it. He's saying here, that God has the ability to remove that which annoys us. And you know what? He doesn't do this by removing us from the situation. You know what he often does with believers? He changes their heart about the situation they're in. Many of you will be praying, Lord, get that guy out of my life. And what will happen is the Lord will get you out of your own life. That flesh that's in you, he will tear that apart and put a new heart in you toward that person. And then, boy, to say that our spiritual bellies are full to the brim by the feeding of his word. God alone meets the condition of a human being's need for rest. Our shepherd knows the best pastures to eat from and the best streams and waterways to drink from. The still waters won't frighten the sheep. They'll drink down deeply, only from calm sources. The good shepherd is aware of his people's frailty and thoughtful of how best to lead them. After leading Israel out of Egypt, many of you will recall 
that this journey was not very long. Just a few days, right? Less than two weeks. Eleven days, if I recall correctly. And you would think God would lead them directly to the most convenient spots in the most direct way, but he didn't do that. Why did he not do that? Well, he explains it to Moses in Exodus chapter 13, verse 17. I'll read it to you. There, then it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest perhaps the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. What could be worse for the people of God having been traumatized by their time as slaves for 430 years or to give up on the freedom that God had just won them? by being intimidated by the sight of war, still waters. God knows where he's leading us. And the best way to bring us there with all of our mental faculties intact. When we are on his path, we're going the right direction. Where we need to be, but not only where, but when we need to be. And when we're on that path, he's busy restoring our souls. See, it's not all about the destination. It's about what's happening in you as you go. This word here, restoring, it speaks of repairing something or bringing one refreshment. And the tense of the verb is that it's repeated and continuous. The original hearers would have heard this phrase this way. He is always repairing refreshing and restoring my soul. Now, how many of us know that? How many of us know that that's something that's happening all the time? It's something that he does daily, hourly. Sometimes we think we've gotten over stuff. We think we've gone the, the whole way and we don't ever have to need to worry about anything again and that, that person's not going to bother us and then that person shows up. And wait a minute, I'm still bothered. I'm still being dealt with about that issue. He's still working in us. But have you ever wondered why? So that he can lead me in righteousness for his name's sake. Do you realize that a lamb that is injured will never walk where he's led? sin and a refusal to submit myself to the healing institutions that God has ordained will stunt my progress in righteousness. Pain, either self-inflicted or experienced from without, will always lead a sheep to look for spiritual shortcuts. Continued attention and obedience to the word, fellowship with like-minded believers, and communion are the quickest and safest means in God's economy toward righteousness. But what does it matter if I obey him all the time? What does it matter if I always do what he says? And, and that's a problem right there where you understand, you do not understand the word Lord, if that's, your, that, if that's your attitude. But let me answer your question anyway, you rebels. Why is it, what does God get from my obedience to him? Aside from your safety and flourishing, which I would assume all of us are invested in, to believe that God has the very best plan for our lives that leads to safety and our flourishing, I'd imagine you'd want to buy in on that. But beyond that, he gets the world's attention. Listen to these alternate translations of verse 3. He leads me down the right paths for the sake of his reputation. That's the New English translation. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. The New Living translation. In the end, God is putting us through onto the right paths for our own flourishing. But that isn't his only motive. He's demonstrating through us what all could expect from him. Through you, God is openly recruiting. You are a living, breathing commercial for what he can do in someone's life. 
And actually, the longer that anyone knows you, the better the commercial is. Because some people know what you were like before you knew Jesus. Before you had a shepherd, when you were just wandering around like a crazy sheep, doing all kinds of weird stuff that got you arrested or shot at. I know where I'm speaking. My grandparents used to live right around, right around the corner. <laughs> He's telling the world as he displays his character in us that this, this is possible for anyone. If he can do it with you, he can do it with anyone. Now you might think that's an impious or arrogant thought to think that God would say something like this about himself. And it would be if he were any other being. But because it's just him, it's just facts. Verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Listen, when you are being led by the shepherd, you can be assured that you're being led to the most God-glorifying destination that you can go to. But that destination, because some of us go, yes, he's leading me. And therefore, my life is going to be nothing but peaches and roses. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this congregation is very alive with wisdom. I can, you can feel it. That destination in our lives is not ever reached without difficulty. Indeed, there are times when the Lord's vision for our lives demands that he leads us through necessarily daunting and intimidating terrain that cannot be avoided. Let's pick this up in verse 4. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Even if I walk through the valley of the death shadow. What a harrowing description. The words are very interesting, don't you think? How many of it just how many of you even just if you saw a sign for death shadow how many would just go that way nobody would choose it right is David making a statement is he making a statement about death and his perspective upon it it's a foreboding shadow but it's nothing more than the blockage of light indeed for a believer this is true as death is an enemy that is vanquished its teeth are removed shadows are not harmful to anyone and that's one explanation it's cer certainly a matter of truth Believers are never afraid to die, though we're quite picky about the way it might happen. I myself have put in the request for, in my sleep, natural causes. That's my favorite uh, view of how I'd like to go. I read, though, recently of a man who died laughing at his own jokes. I'll take that one. I'll go, I'll go for that one. Laughing at my own jokes. I already do that. I just get a good one going and kick the bucket that way. I'm good for that. But most people, most commentators believe this to be an actual valley, which was home to a cemetery in the first temple period and then a place of tombs during the second temple period. Being lined on both sides with death, it was a foreboding place of darkness in a valley, one that Jesus himself even traveled on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. What an apt name. By the way, that isn't the only valley you and I have to traverse on our way toward the righteous path that God's leading us in. In Psalm 84, verse 6, this is, that psalm is called the Pilgrim's Psalm. It refers there to the valley of Baca, not the politician, but the valley of weeping. Being a necessary destination on the way to Jerusalem. Today's Christians need to understand and learn there's a shadow of death and there's weeping on the road. If you're weeping tonight, if you're somebody who's known pain and you, th you thought this Christian thing would, would not be like this, and maybe you're not, you're thinking, maybe I'm weird because I'm going through what I'm going through. Those are necessary places. And it doesn't make you any less spiritual. 
for having to face those things. But David says that even in that place, he says, I will fear no evil. Why? Because God was with him. Notice it's not the evil that's eliminated. It's the fear that's mitigated. The evil will be there until Christ's rule happens in Jerusalem from a physical location on this planet. Evil will be a consistent problem that you and I will have to deal with. It's not going to get better. The rest of us that are watching online, reading different kind of periodicals, we're finding out every day new lows of evil. And we would think, many of us who are old enough to have been part of uh, greater days spiritually in this country, many of us would believe it can't get worse. And then Monday happens, and it got worse. How did that happen? It's what's happening now. But the fear is what's gone. Because a believer knows, even though there's something immediate about fear that can't be ever denied, you can't be a person who goes, I'm not going to fear anything, and then just not fear it. The idea here is that that fear is not going to motivate your next move if your shepherd is with you. God is with us, and his rod is sufficient for us. But what is God... What is David trying to convey with these words? So both the rod and the staff, they refer to what the casual eye would see as a, as a walking stick, but it's far more. The crooked staff is, is an essential tool of the shepherd. The rod, of course, was a measure of discipline when the lamb got out of line. The staff would have been used as a means of support, a means of defense against the a predator. Now we can understand the Lord's staff being a comfort. Maybe maybe you've seen this video. I don't know if you've seen this. There's a, a lamb. This, the scene opens up with a lamb stuck in a little crevasse in a, in a dirt road. It's been opened up by the rain. You guys had rain around here right, recently, right? Seemed like it didn't stop raining for a long time. I thought I better build an ark. <laughs> we, we have two by two animals. We have two rabbits. You know, whatever. I mean, we, we should get this thing going. It was really, really very harrowing. Twelve, you know, what, storms. Of, uh, what did they call them? Anyway, there were a lot of rain. There's a video of this lamb in a crevasse. And the shepherd pulls him out. And he bounces up just a little bit until he jumps right back into it and another five feet away. And that is the total microcosmic picture of each one of us. <laughs> That's what Jesus gets. That's his inheritance. He's ours. That's his. Each one of us knows what it's like for God to pull us out of the pit only to watch us jump back in voluntarily. So we are comforted by the fact that his staff <laughs> pulls us out. We love that. That's very comforting. But what about the rod? Now, we've accepted that our lives are God's canvas to paint upon. We accept his guidance. But as we grow, we also become aware of our inability to follow precisely, if at all, when tempted and drawn aside from our purpose. You know, I hate to tell you this. I know there are several very strong spiritual warriors in here. But there are sins that easily beset us. Hebrews 12, 2. How many of you saw the same idiot I did on the freeway tonight? Right? See, the other person's always the idiot. <laughs> that was very uncomfortable for some of you. Some of you were the idiot. I can see. It's a, it's a, I recognize your vehicle as a matter when I came in. So we have our sin, but then we also have that inability to totally also always interpret his intentions. We're doing our best to honor him, but sometimes we're fooled by our own desires. And it's at that time that his correction is such a blessing. Because you want to do what's right. You're hoping, you're thinking, you've done what's right, only to realize, oh, I didn't see this. It's at that time when his rod of correction, though painful, is absolutely necessary. And in fact, for the child of God, it's not only necessary but it is a proof of our relationship. 
If we had time, I'd have you turn to Hebrews chapter 12 and read there about how it is necessary for you and I to be chastened by the Lord, to prove that relationship to, to Him. <laughs> He's saying to us there, and if I'll have you read it on your own time, but as you think about the heroes of the faith, they didn't get away with not being chastened. We aren't going to be that way either. So thank Him for His correction. Thank Him that He does that. Thank Him that as I walk through the dark valleys of life, I'm grateful for His presence correcting my course and setting me peacefully at ease. Verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You and I are lambs in this world, surrounded by our enemies. But because he is with us, we can eat right out in the open. Right in front of a bunch of ravening wolves. We're safe and secure. There's no weapon that's formed against you that can prosper. There is an enemy that can overcome our shepherd. So we can have a luxurious meal right out in the open. You and I might be hospitable. Some are even given the gift of hospitality. You have special plates. And napkins, you never use them. But when someone comes in, you have them out. You open up that cabinet. That's the cabinet, like if your little kids or if your grandkids or your kids get into that cabinet, a gunshot goes out right over their head. You won't have it. These are not to be used except for company. You have those gifts. Some people have that gift. Me, when people come over to my house, they get a Dixie cup, and they can sit wherever they, there's the space. I just don't have the gift. But we might think, <laughs> thank you, we might think we have great hospitality, but we know nothing about hospitality. That of the Eastern people. If you came into their house, if a meal was prepared for you, you came under the protection of the person and their entire family. They would protect you to their own death. Even if they didn't like you. You have to remember, in these days, in the old desert nomadic days, you were the entertainment. Somebody came into town, like it wasn't, you didn't have TVs like they do today. It was so funny. We were in Israel back in 2001. My, my wife was great with child. Our first one, as a matter of fact. And she was having uh, all kinds of all kinds of struggles, try, you know, just trying to walk around with, you know, big belly and whatever, you know, trying to get down into archaeological sites and whatever. It was so much fun. At least I had fun. She was hating life for a while, but I just remember thinking we, as we came to this Bedouin tent, thinking about all these, all the and antiquated ways and whatever else. We walked into the tent and someone had a big screen TV <laughs> just right in there and a RAV4, or, you know, a forerunner out in the back. Like, oh, this totally ruins the whole picture. But, but back in the old days, in the time of the Bible, if you came across a caravan, you were the night's entertainment. And even if they didn't like you, you came under their tent, you were covered to the death of the person who brought you into their tent. Now that sheds some light on some other kind of interesting stories in the Bible. Genesis chapter 19 the book of Judges, same thing happens. I'll let you read those on your own. Some pretty sticky situations. But that's the way they thought about it in the East. It was customary in that part of the world, by the way, also to anoint guests with oil. That to me sounds just absolutely repulsive. I don't even like cream. Ugh. But it was a welcome, pro welcome practice there in the arid and body odor producing climates. You know, I don't know if you knew this. Shepherds also anointed their lambs with oils in their noses to keep flies from laying eggs in there. Now that's just free information. I, I had to learn it, so you do. <laughs> but 
in all this, it shows the Lord's extravagance toward his people. As we sit there in his presence, our, our cup isn't just full, it's overflowing the lip. It's plentiful with more than we can take and certainly more than we deserve. And that leads David to this wonderful conclusion because here he is experiencing this. If you're experiencing this, then you come to a, a surely moment without question, without a doubt, given the phenomenal blessings that God has given his sheep during their lives, there can only be one conclusion. If this is a token of what he's going to show, then there's something really good coming. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Now goodness, it pertains to that which is pleasant and agreeable, even if the road there is not. Wherever you're going, whatever part of the journey you're in now, and it may not be a good part, you may think this is one of the stinkier parts of your journey in faith. This is a chapter you wish wasn't in the book. But I promise you, not because I'm anything, I'm nothing. But the word promises us, surely goodness. Surely goodness is your off-ramp. That's where you're headed. Oh man, you don't, you don't know my story. I don't know your story. I don't need to know your story because I have his word and you have his word so even if you have a story and you believe the enemy's lie you need to check yourself against the word because the word says goodness and mercy mercy it's this famous word in the book of Psalms Chesed, which refers to covenant love. It is that particular blessing granted from God to his people. Now, do we all love children? We all love children, right? Such cute little beings. They're so fun to look at from a distance. And, and, they're, and, and if they're yours, <laughs> as far away as possible. No, I'm kidding. Um, but, you know, they're so tiny. You spend all those years, and they say the cutest things, and you record all of it. And you get it on, you know, they're not trying to run away from you and say all these weird slang words in front of you. You know, oh, slay, Dad. You know, what? You want me to kill you? I do. I want to kill you. <laughs> Some days. But, you know, so they're so cute when they're so small. And, and any kid. If any one of your children walks up to me tonight, they're just cute and they want to ask for a dollar. I, and that's why I don't carry money. I would give it to them. <laughs> I don't have a... I'm all, do you take Visa? No. So, all of us love kids. We'll get lollipops, you know, help them along. Whatever, if you need a hand, or want to come over here, you need some help. We'll give, we'll give a good amount to that kid. But our kids, we're saving for. We have accounts that have their names on them. Everything that we have is theirs. That's the difference between loving a kid and hesed. That's the word mercy. It's particular blessing from God to us reserved for those in covenant with him. And there is an even better idea behind these words. Listen to this. So we just saw, surely mercy, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's kind of good enough. But listen, this other translation, I really enjoyed this. Surely goodness and mercy will hunt for me all the days of my life. <laughs> what a promise. But wait, there's more. I used to love coming home from church. 
just to make myself feel better, I'd watch Gene Scott. I go, at least I didn't say that. At least I didn't hold a cigar and yell at people and ask for them to give me money all, you know. At least I didn't do that. But then after Gene Scott was over, it was time for Ron Popeil and infomercials. And I could sit there and veg out and watch an infomercial three, four times. I remember the magic bullet and I'm thinking like, the magic bullet, it can take concrete and it can blend it. I don't know why you would ever blend concrete. But at least I know there's a product out there. And I, would have to, and I know that I bought a set of Miracle Blades from this guy because he cut, cut through paper. And, like, and we still hold those Miracle Blades today. I mean, if you want to sell me anything, just get, me, get an infomercial. I'll buy it. I used to love those. So I always love that there's more. And David knew this because God was eternal. The life that he offered now was merely a shadow of what he could expect for as long as God lived. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There's a huge difference between visiting a house dwelling in a house. When I come to your house, if you ever invited me, if you have that gift of hospitality, and you have those special plates, I'll come in, but I'm going to come in and sit very gingerly on your furniture. I'm going to make sure it can handle my weight. I'm going to ask you if I could open your fridge and have anything out of it. I'm not just going to go over and open it. I'm going to ask you, can I open your fridge? When I go to your restroom, I'm not going to look in your cabinets to see what medications you're taking. You guys are going, okay, we can invite you over. (laughs) That's okay. This guy's all right. But in my home, what I see our kids do, first thing, shoes, every direction. What is it about kids and shoes? I always know where my shoes are because they're on my feet. They stay on my feet. I don't get kids. They throw their shoes. Oh, and then, you know, every time my shoes are off, it's Lego City. I'm in all kinds of pain. So my shoes stay on my feet. But my kids throw them everywhere they want. They open up the, they open the fridge. They don't ask for anything. My wife goes and dutifully shops for our family, and five minutes later, it's like a locust horde has come through our refrigerator. Everything that was there is gone. I mean, right now, it's the best time ever because my son is in Mexico. My, my daughter's, you know, they're, they're eating like little birds. I can't believe how long food lasts. It's really incredible. It is incredible. In any event, to dwell somewhere is to look at where you're going to sit and you plop. You don't just, you don't feather yourself down. You plop on that thing. You open everything you want. You, you take off the lid from the milk and you don't even put it back on. So that's your milk. <laughs> so I'm just going to go straight for Why mess up a dish? That's what it means to dwell. You and I are going to dwell in the house of the Lord. We're going to belong there. It's not going to be a thing like I think here on earth. Because, you know, let's be honest, right? Every one of us has a little doubt in the back of our mind that maybe the accounting department in heaven got it wrong. Maybe we're going to get there and they go, uh, you, and then trap door. (laughs) You know, (laughs) it's like, whoa, (laughs) neat slide. Um, Every one of us feels a little bit like I want to get, I'm going to get there and I want to get behind Greg and just like kind of hide behind him for like 4,000 years or something. Maybe they won't see me. But dwelling means belonging and knowing that no one can ever displace you from where you are. That is where our shepherd shepherds us too. Now before we leave this chapter... I'd like to point out how each phrase that we've just looked at points to a distinctive name held by God as revealed in Scripture. This psalm is an illustration of each descriptive title 
of God. For example, the Lord is my shepherd. The name Jehovah Ra'ah, the Lord my shepherd. I shall not want Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord my peace. He restores my soul. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord my healer. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord my righteousness. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Jehovah Shema, the Lord is present. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. Jehovah Ezer the Lord my help. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Jehovah Nissi, the Lord, my standard of victory. You anoint my head with oil. Jehovah in Kadesh, the Lord my holiness. My cup runs over. Jehovah Manah, the Lord my portion. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jehovah Chelech, the Lord, my inheritance. Some of you are going, I thought that guy was Mexican. He said, Halek. <laughs> I could do that. I can't even speak Spanish, but I can say Halek. But when you look at those phrases, remember those names. That's who our God is. That's who he has always been to his sheep. As we begin to close out this passage, I'd like to give you some quick outlines from a few different perspectives in order to synthesize the lessons that we've discovered here. The first thing I want to do is look at it from the shepherd's view. First of all, we see the shepherd's provision in that he meets his lamb's needs physically, emotionally, spiritually. Second, notice the shepherd's purpose he leads and guides in righteousness, comforting and correcting as we travel through life's valleys. And finally, after you've seen the shepherd's provision, the shepherd's purpose, note the shepherd's power. He sets me safely at an open table with my enemies. And he has the power to bring me home to him eternally. That's from the shepherd's perspective. What about from the lamb's perspective? That would be you and I. From our perspective, a lamb under the shepherd, one, confesses contentment. I have no lack. Paul will later say that he's content with whatever state he's in, whether Arizona or California. No, I'm kidding. Whether this kind of thing or that kind of thing. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment is to want what you have so that you have what you want. So a lamb confesses contentment. Second, a lamb confirms their commitment to conformity. They want to walk in righteousness. They want to be corrected. They want to have the shepherd lead them. And finally, a lamb under the shepherd confesses contentment, confirms their commitment to conformity, and can be assured of eternal community. I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord. I'm going to dwell with you. You know, we barely met tonight. I've never seen some of your faces. You've never seen mine, and, and you're not the better for it. <laughs> but it is what it is. I'm not very pretty now, but wait till I'm glorified. It'll be six-pack abs, the whole deal. I've got the order, I've got the order in. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. We've never seen each other. And yet we're going to live together for eternity. We're going to be the community. We're all going to, you know, Pastor Joe Foch always likes to say that, He's going to be perennially like 25, 30 years old. We're going to be in our prime. I don't know what that means. 
I, I was I was in worse shape at 25 than I am today. So I don't know. I probably I'd rather take now. But what a joy it is to think that you and I are going to dwell with the Lord. This life, which seems so permanent, which seems like it's never going to end, all the struggles we have, all the difficulties, someday that's going to be a vague memory when we dwell with him. Now finally, we have to look at it one final way. And this isn't probably for you. Maybe this is for those outside your family members, because it might be helpful to distinguish at this moment who is not a lamb. After we've looked at this passage, God cannot be your shepherd if these things are true. And again, I say this for the benefit of those perhaps that are watching online or that maybe you'll share this with, and you'll look at this passage with somebody and say, Here's a test for us to understand whether or not you are actually a lamb under the shepherd's care. Because God is not your shepherd if you are your own master. If you're the master of your own destiny, God can't be your shepherd. He's not going to share the reins. God's not your shepherd if you're consistently discontent with what you have. God can't be your shepherd if you're unable to find or dwell in peace. He's not your shepherd if you're unwilling to avail yourself to his healing by submitting to his ordinances. God cannot be your shepherd, especially if you have little regard for his standards of righteousness. Today we're hearing a lot of people, part of the alphabet mafia, who are talking about how it only says this many times in the Bible that this sin is bad. It only says it maybe three or four times. Folks, a Christian who is under the shepherd knows he only needs to say it once. And that's law. God cannot be your shepherd if you're given to living a life of fear. It doesn't mean you're going to not be afraid. But it does mean that if you are not, if you're not his, you will be dominated by fear. You won't want to give it up because it makes you safe to feel that. It's almost like fear is your Lord. And God can't be your shepherd if another Lord is on the throne. If someone else is your help, if you have a functional Savior, sometimes people, if it's drinking or drugs or whatever else it might be, or you're looking at a counselor as the main person in your life, if you have some other standard of victory besides submission to Christ, if your holiness is found in your own works, I'd be concerned. If your portion is what is found in this life and your inheritance is only what can be spent in this life, I'd seriously reconsider one's position. But the Lord is my shepherd. He satisfies his sheep. He anticipates our needs, heals our wounds, leads us in his right paths, correcting and comforting along the way. He's my help, my victory, my holiness, my portion in this life, and my inheritance in the next. I pray you can say the same. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are a good shepherd of the sheep. We thank you, Father, that you are the one who grants such peace and comfort. Lord, where would we be without your hand upon us? Who would we be if we would not submit ourselves unto you? Father, we thank you so much that you have been so gracious in taking us under your wing using your rod and your staff to comfort and correct. 
And Father, I would just lift up any here tonight, Lord, that are feeling as if, Lord, you're not involved. There's so much pain, sorrow, so much difficulty. Father, convince them. Allow your Holy Spirit just to touch their hearts tonight. Let them know, even if they're in the valley of weeping, even if they're in the valley of the shadow of death, that they don't need to fear any evil. Lord, you're not not with them. You are with them. So we praise you, Lord, for those things. And God, we would just ask if there are any that maybe are watching tonight that don't know you, they've never surrendered to you. Right now, if you're watching online or if you're in this room and you've never committed your heart to Jesus Christ, you've never said, God, my righteousness is filthy rags. I have nothing to offer you. Maybe you think you're such a great sinner. I only have one word for you. He's a greater Savior. So if that's anybody in here or anybody online, we invite you to take God at his word. Believe in his son. Repent of your sin either your sin that's egregious and awful or your self-righteousness that is just as offensive to God. Come and be reconciled to Jesus. Come and be reconciled to God who wants to give you life through Christ. And I don't know if that's anybody here, but if that's you and you've never committed yourself to Christ, today is the day for you to say, Jesus trust you. I believe you. I repent of my sin. Please take me as your own. There's no magic words that need to be said. There's just a change of heart that needs to happen. And if that's happening for you tonight, if that's anybody in here, please do come see us afterward. We'll be up here talking, sharing with anybody who needs to pray. And if you're online, same invitation goes. But Lord, we thank you that you're our shepherd. We praise you now. And we thank you in Jesus' name. We stand for one last one. Joyful, joyful, we adore you, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before you, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness dark of doubt away giver of eternal gladness fill us with the light of day Cause you are the one who saves you are the one who saves you are the one whose hands lift us from the grave you are the light of life everlasting day you are the one who takes all our sins away you are giving and forgiving ever blessing ever blessed fountain of the joy the living ocean depths of happy rest cause you are the one you are the one who saves. You are the one whose hands lift us from the grave. And you are the light of life, the everlasting day. You are the one who takes all our sins away. Jesus, you are my rescue. Jesus, you are my rescue. I give you everything I am. Oh, Jesus, you are my rescue. Jesus, you are my rescue. I give you everything I am.
fountain of the joy of living ocean depths of happiness because you are the one who saves you are the one who saves you are the one whose heads lift us from the grave and you are the light of life the everlasting day you are the one who takes all our sins away yes you are the one who takes all our sins away you are the one who takes all our sins away amen once again we'll be over here if you'd like to talk and pray we would really have the op- love to have the opportunity with you. God bless you. Have a good night. Hi, everybody. Pastor Greg, Calvary Chapel, Harupa Valley. Hey, we're so glad that you've been enjoying the videos, and we just know that God has been touching you and just giving you a blessing through these teachings. But, you know, we'd like to give you a challenge. Since this material is available, as you know, you can go to the website and pull these videos down, but we would like to challenge you. Since you're enjoying these teachings on a regular basis, we want to challenge you, why not share these videos? You've got lots of friends on Facebook and so forth and social media. Why not inject the gospel message, the Bible teachings of of the Lord into, into your share partners? It would be a great opportunity to maybe start a conversation, but we would really like you to be encouraged and consider passing these teachings on. We want people to be benefited, so let's allow the Lord to do what he would like to do. But in the meantime, we're so glad that you've been joining us and enjoying these teachings. They will continue to come as the Lord tarries, but again, enjoy, enjoy the Lord. Thank you so much, and continue to pray for Calvary Chapel here in the city of Harupa Valley. God bless you, Pastor Greg, once again, and we'll catch up with you next time. Have a great week in the Lord. Bye now.